With the rolling around of the new year, I thought it would be interesting to take a look at a single market, in this case, the S&P 500, to see where we have come from, where we are at present, and more importantly, what might need to occur for me to change my current opinion uh, regarding being bearish the market. Now note, none of this is a prediction. This is just simply a series of observations I have about the market, both past and present, and what I would like to see in the future to generate a change in my stance. Notice it's not a prediction of when, if, and how the market will change. It is simply the things I need to see in a mechanistic way to change my opinion. As with all things, we need to start with the context of the market, and that is where do we sit at present within the history of the market? Unfortunately, so many trading decisions are made by simply looking back at last week and assuming that is the context. If we look at the longer term history of the S&P 500, and this takes us back to 2002 and incorporates the GFC and the bull market that followed, the little hiccup with COVID and this grinding down that we are experiencing at present. And the first thing that pops into your head when you look at this is the remarkable upward trend that the market experienced. Yes, the GFC rattled everybody because that was a very, very sharp, very, very hard drawdown where the market lost more than 50%. That would cause any investor or trader concern. But post that, the market's recovery has been quite remarkable. You've seen, let's call it a 582% increase in the index from the GSC low to the high before we began to drift down at present. And over the space of 12 years, almost 13 years, that's a remarkable year-on-year -year return on investment. But unfortunately, that environment has built into traders' psyche an expectation that that is the reality of the world. And what they're finding at present is that is not the reality of the world. And to a degree, this dramatic increase in value in the index hides a series of nasty facts that are overlooked. It tends to paper over them. They get lost in scaling issues. And the issue is quite simply this. Including the drawdown we are in at present, the market has had three quite nasty pullbacks. There is the GFC. There is the little pop we had with COVID, where the market recovered very, very quickly. And there is the current grind down. So sequentially, we've lost 54.8% in the, the over a given time, 33.9%. And currently, give or take, depending on when you view this video, 24.1%. So that's the reality of the market. So yes, markets do go up. Indexes in particular go up because of their constant rebalancing. But we need to be careful that when we view indices over the long term, we don't ignore these periods that we are aware of them. So what is the relevance of this? Well, if you had been aware of these previous events and events going back to 2000, even back to 1987, if you've got more data going back to the 1970s, you would accept that markets don't always go up. So that as the market unraveled at present, that wouldn't be a shock to you because it would be built into your belief system that this is part of the standard operating procedure of markets. They go up, then they go down. Sometimes they go up a lot, sometimes they go down a lot. And sometimes those events occur very, very quickly, and they almost blindside traders. So again, we come back to this point I harp on over and over again. You need to be aware of the history of the market. You can ignore that if you wish, but in part, you're flying blind. So the point I want to make about this video and, and my changing view, what might change my view, is quite simply that I look for capitulation. The market simply has to give up the ghost and everybody within it simply has to give up 
and you get this widespread narrative that the market will never go up again and the world has ended. So this raises the question as to what capitulation looks like. And it looks like this. It is a dramatic swing down with an increase in volume on the selling. So everybody is throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And this is the situation that occurred during the COVID pop. That was a very, very sharp move down. But the event is still the same. You still get this build up in selling where everybody lets go of equities, selling pressure comes off, market reverses. And to date, we have not really seen that. The market has ground its way down. And it may set a precedent where it grinds its way down, does not capitulate and reverses. That is quite possible. Or any thesis you have about the market can be proved wrong by the market because the only vote that counts is the market. My prognostications as to what I would like to see don't count. I simply have to react to what is occurring. And I'll get to that point in more depth in a second. And just in terms of capitulation, this, this is what happened in the GFC. I've got a chart a little bit later on that shows this on a daily scale, where the early, sort of the savagery of the early selling as the market began to reverse is quite apparent. But the situation we have at present is simply this. We have a market that is channeling down. And volume in and of itself doesn't seem to be much of an issue. We have to remember that the US markets are enormous. Compared to our local market, they are vast. Traders sometimes forget the Australian market on any given day might comprise less than 2% of all world equity markets. It's quite small. And if we look at the volume distribution here on the S&P 500, you can see it's fairly constrained. There are occasional days of heavy selling, but then they're matched by the occasional day of heavy buying. There isn't a mad panic to get rid of equities. There are high volume days, low volume days. There are high volume days with selling. There are low volume days with selling. And the same applies for buying. This grind made me have a look at the distribution of returns for stocks in the S&P 500 over the last 52 weeks, because I wanted to see where the grind was coming from and whether there was anything positive in the distribution of returns that could tell any sort of story. And when I map the distribution, all you need to worry about is the shape of the curve. The red bar, you can consider that our zero line. It is the point at which stock returns transition from positive on the right-hand side to negative on the left-hand side. You can see on the right-hand side, interestingly, there are still outlier positive moves. And you can see where the majority of negative moves are clustered. They're not that dramatic. Yes, there are some stocks that have given up the ghost completely and which have drawdowns of the order of 60% and will throw Tesla into that bunch. But most of the negative returns are clustered between that sort of zero and minus 25%. That sounds a lot. That, that, that sounds quite dramatic as a drawdown in a given stock. But it could be worse. It's not like the tech rec, where the drawdowns were of the order of anywhere between 75 and 90%, nor is it equivalent to the widespread carnage we've seen in the NASDAQ 100, which really has given up the ghost. And we're seeing some sort of pivot shift in, let's just say, the overwhelming sycophantic love that people had for tech stocks and the people who run them. And when I fired up the calculator and had a look at this, I found that 67% of stocks in the S&P 500 had a negative return for the last 52-week period. The worst of these was Signature Bank, with a drawdown of about 67%. The best was First Solar, where you're looking at 100% plus gain. So there are still outlier stocks in the market 
irrespective of what is happening with the market. So in terms of what I would like to see, and remember what I would like to see as a relevancy, I've mentioned this before in some of the videos. I tend to view an index as more than an aggregate of individual stocks. Each one of those stocks is doing something different over different time frames. And this is the percentage of S&P 500 stocks above a moving average. And I, I put this in here so you can reference it yourself. And you can get this from barchart.com. And you'll notice that each one of these you can chart. So you can change the time frame. And it's important to note that I don't use the daily time frame. It, it's too constrained and there's too much noise within the signal. I tend to blow the time frame out, as we'll have a look in a second. So keep this in the back of your mind. But the thing that strikes me the most about this is simply this. It's a big fat red line drawn across the chart. And if prices move beyond that big fat red line in an increase in volume, because the number of stocks above their given moving average have increased, then my view will change to bullish. You'll notice here on this chart, this is a longer term chart looking at the number of stocks above their 200 week moving average. And I've marked in two points of capitulation where everybody thought the world was going to end and the market reversed. I, I regard this as an interesting and powerful metric because it tells me something about the internal temperature of the market. It tells me something about the psychology of everyone involved. Remember, the psychology is represented here. This is the expression of the way people think. And what I want to see is this sort of event that occurred during the S&P, during the GFC with the S&P 500. And this is a daily chart. And you can see in the October period, in the first week leading into the second week, there was a great deal of selling. Selling lifted and held high for most of the October, November period. And that's what I'm looking for. Volume then drifted off and the market recovered. Because what that selling tells me is the first pop of when stocks hit their absolute rock bottom in terms of the psychology of people trading them occurs in this first little blue box that I've noted on the chart here. Note it takes a few goes, but that this is not a timing tool. This simply tells me something about the overall temperature. What tells me more is this. So if I get capitulation, heavy volume, followed by a lift and a break in this downtrend, then my point of view changes. But note, I have to reinforce the statement that my point of view is irrelevant. Yes, you could say I have an edge, but what the mental model I like to operate under to keep me humble and defensive is to say to myself, well, your edge is little more than a guess. So you need to be defensive in the way you approach your guesses. Doing so creates a defensive way of thinking. A defensive way of thinking is a mechanism for survival. For example, if we go back to this chart and we look at this first blue box, I could look at this and say, well, I have a metric that says when the percentage of stocks above their 200 period moving average falls to a certain percent, I go long. The problem with that is that in doing so, I would start to go long in this October, November period where the market still had room to fall. It still had time and capacity to do me damage. So we return to this. And the, the point I will leave you with is that 
the thing I have observed in trading, your observations might be different, your need for touchstones may be different to mine. But I found that the simplest of tools is the most effective. And so for me, a big fat red line coupled with an observation of volume and from that an understanding of what people are feeling conveys to me a great deal of information. It also brings in a mechanistic component in that I can't shift my view to bullish until a certain event has occurred, and that event is immutable. Price needs to be above this red line after some form of capitulation. Anything else is a narrative you've created to fulfill, in many respects, a wish. There is no narrative you can create that predicts the future. Likewise, there is no technical tool you can create that predicts the future. But what you can set in place are a series of rules that removes a lot of the chaos from the decision-making process, but more importantly, removes a great deal of the emotional stress that trading involves.